Father, we are so grateful that we can come to you with all of our needs, requests, and thanksgiving for all that you've done. Thank you for answered prayer, Lord, for so many. Lord, we have seen you answer prayers for healing, for health, for moisture. Lord, you have, you're just so good, and thank you for that. And Lord, we do pray for those that are hurting and in need. We pray specifically for Roy and Glenda, that they would heal from the COVID and be able to return to us quickly. I also pray for Carol, that you will fully help her to recover, that she can return to activities and all the ministry and service she does for not only our community, but for our church. And Father, for Kareem, we pray that you would help her to fully heal and uh, for her arm to get better, for her to just recover from the heart attack and be able to uh, have the strength back that she had before the heart attack. And again, Lord, we are so grateful for this rain. We are just uh, in your hands. We know that you have it. And we are just, uh, we have, Lord, um, you are so good for us. And you are the one that brings rain. And we acknowledge you uh, before all others, Lord, that you have uh, answered our prayers and that you will continue to bring moisture as we need it this year. And Lord, as we look at your word this morning, help me to communicate clearly the things I need to communicate, and Lord, uh, to be able to uh, share, Lord, the truths that you have given us and how we are to live based on that truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was going to take this moment to make sure that the men were behaving and not playing with their toys during the service, but I don't see any headlamps on, so I think we're okay at the moment. But, uh, okay, Lane, put it up. <laughs> but uh, happy Father's Day to all of you men, and uh, it's good to be back. Uh, I miss it when I don't have an opportunity to preach, but it's also nice to get a break, and I really appreciated you both and Jared uh, for filling in while I was at CYA training. Uh, you both did an excellent job. And, and what's interesting is wherever you go in scripture, and again, Bo shared with us from the life of, uh, of Jonah, and uh, Jared shared with us throughout the New Testament about the Holy Spirit, the message of the word of God is always the same. And I think that's so important to realize that Wherever you go, it's a consistent message that tells us truth. And Paul, uh, for those of you that are visiting, I'm in the book of Romans, have been this year, and probably will be for the rest of the year. And we're in Romans chapter 8, and we are looking at how we are to live as believers in Christ. Again, chapter 6, 7, and 8 is teaching on sanctification and who we are in Christ and how we're to live based on that and we are justified by faith and God now calls us to live according to what we have been called and what God has done for us. Uh, before I go to Romans 8 though, I wanna do a quick review of how we got there in the very previous, in the passage right before that. The end of the book of, uh, or the end of chapter seven Paul deals with a very personal issue. And I ran into an old friend uh, in the store the other day who was talking about uh, he's been working through Romans chapter 7 and 8 and all his teaching there. And it was interesting. I didn't hear him say, which I believe, that Paul is not giving just a general consensus of what's going on in the world at the end of chapter 7. Paul is giving his own personal testimony. Now, it applies to every one of us, but I think it's so much more powerful when we look at it from the perspective of this apostle who has been a believer for many years, who is a mature Christian, and yet he is still struggling with sin. And I think that is something that we need to understand in all of our lives, that we will never get to this point in our lives where we have conquered all sin. That will not happen in this life. But in that passage, and it's important to see, Paul uses the personal pronouns, I, myself, my, and me, 
36 times. We're talking about, you know, 12, 11, 12 verses of Scripture where Paul is using these pronouns over and over again, and it makes it a very awkward reading. I mean, if you were to do that in English class, you'd probably get an F. Uh, it just is not what we're supposed to do. But I believe the Holy Spirit did that specifically to help us understand what Paul was going through and what Paul is talking about here. And the, the issue is Paul summarizes this passage by saying, I believe, I'm the biggest problem in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm the biggest problem in the world that I will ever face. We tend to look outward. And if it wasn't for that person or this situation, everything would be fine. But you know, it's interesting. We've been praying for rain. And praise God, rain came. But some of us look at it and say, the biggest problem we've got in the world is we got this drought. Guess what? We woke up this morning and we still have ourselves. We're still the biggest problem. And I think that's important because Paul summarizes his struggle with sin. In verse 24, he says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who's going to set me free? And so I summarize this passage with two statements. First of all, my biggest problem in the world is me. I am not, that's, that person out there or that situation or the economy or politics or all those other things that we could cite, that's not the problem. I look at the problem every morning when I look in the mirror. And here's the other thing. As long as I am focused on my struggle to overcome sin, I will fail. I can't fix me. And I think that's important for us to understand. But if we stop here, we would despair of our sinful mess. But Paul doesn't stop there. He immediately answers the question. And he moves forward to victory over sin. This victory that we can have. Because he answers the question with the next verse. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. The answer to my biggest problem with sin is Jesus Christ. And it's very important what he says there. It's in Jesus Christ. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that and even as we review where we were three weeks ago. So Paul then takes and proceeds to chapter 8 and goes into detail in how through Jesus we can live victorious over sin. And he begins with verse 1 where he says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. Paul begins the victory by reinforcing a foundational doctrine that he's been teaching throughout the book of Romans. And that is we are made right with God by our relationship to Christ, not by anything we do. And again, when we are struggling with sin, we tend to focus on that. And when we're focused on that, we can even come to a place where we can say, I must not belong to the Lord. But Paul is saying, I am not condemned by God. Why? Because he knew he belonged to Christ. You see, Christ saved him by his grace and not because of his performance. And we should be able to say the same thing. Even though I may be struggling with sin in my life, I know that I'm forgiven and there is no condemnation for me because I belong to Jesus Christ. So if I've trusted in Christ as my Savior, I belong to Christ and I'm saved. And again, the key word is I belong to Him. It's not just an intellectual assent that I have. And this is a great starting place for us as we look at overcoming sin is the fact that we are forgiven. Because here's the other part, and I deal with this a lot with the guys in the jail when I go in, is that they are struggling with shame and guilt. And it's hard for them to move forward because they made this mess of their lives, but we can all be there. We make this mess of our lives, and it's hard to move forward because we are ashamed of where we are and what we've done. But because of Christ, we have assurance of salvation. And because we have assurance of salvation, 
we can move forward and focus on what is God is wanting to do in our lives through his power. He goes on in verse 2 and says this, And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And again, Paul is emphasizing two things in this verse. One we've looked at at length, looking at Romans chapter 6, 7, uh, up to point, verse eight, uh, chapter 8, and that is the power we inherited, the power of sin we inherited from Adam is broken for a Christian. It no longer has the power to control us. Paul says, reckon your old sinful nature dead. This is so important in our victory over sin because we can feel defeated. If you've struggled for a sin a long time and you're not having victory over that sin, it's so easy to give up and say, I'll never overcome that sin in my life. But it is through the truth that we are reckoned dead to sin in our lives that we can start the process of overcoming it. But here's the other part, and this is the key to the overcoming. And that is, we are in Jesus Christ, and we have the power to overcome it because when we belong to Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in us. He says the power of the life-giving Spirit. See, the, we have the Holy Spirit. Again, there are those who teach that there's a secret, second work of God he saves us, and then we receive the Holy Spirit at some other point. But that is contrary to Scripture. We have the Holy Spirit from the moment that we are saved. And this new life is what Paul is talking about, a life empowered by the Holy Spirit who will help us overcome sin. And we can live a victorious Christian life. In fact, and I mentioned this before, once Paul introduces the Holy Spirit, in this passage, sin is defeated for the Christian. Once Paul introduces the Holy Spirit in verse 2, the rest of Romans 8, now he is going to challenge us, but he doesn't talk about defeat anymore. He talks about victory. Yes, there will be warfare between the two natures, and that will continue all of our lives. But when the Holy Spirit is in control, the old nature is defeated. This is the primary teaching of this passage, and it correlates with what Paul explained to the Galatian Christians who were attempting to overcome their sin in their own power, where he said in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation by the law of Moses. And again, Paul had spent a lot of time talking about the law in chapter 7, and he again talks about that here in Romans chapter 8. He says the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. And again, we had talked about this before, and this is review for many of you. But the fact is, the, pro the law is perfect. It's holy. It's good. It's wonderful. The problem was never in the law. It was always in the recipients were, who were all Adam's descendants, sinners. And a sinner can never keep the law. And that's what he's saying here. Because of us, the law was weak, not because of the law. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And so what the law could not do, and God knew that, God did. He became one of us. He died for us. And he fulfilled all of the law for us so that we are not uh, lost and not able to have a relationship with God and not having ability to have victory over sin. And he concluded the passage that I looked at the last time in verse 4 where he says this. He did this 
so that the just requirement of law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Again, Jesus fully satisfied the just requirements of the law for us. But when we are saved, we are not just saved in order to go to heaven, but we are saved so we can fulfill the scriptural demands of the law through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And again, Paul is talking about this that was fulfilled from Ezekiel chapter 36 where he said this, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. You see, what we could never do in our old nature, keep the law, we are now capable of doing through the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us as believers in Christ. Ezekiel prophesied what Paul is describing, that the followers of Jesus Christ are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do this. Paul is teaching us to overcome our biggest problem, ourselves, our old sinful nature. And it is by allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us to victorious Christian living. But here's a key, and I mentioned this as I concluded three weeks ago. This cannot be an occasional occurrence when we're in trouble, but by allowing the Holy Spirit to control our lives as habitual experience. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, don't be drunk with wine because that really will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we must constantly be surrendering ourselves to the Holy Spirit for Him to control our lives. And when we are doing that, we will have victory and overcome sin in our lives. We're now going to pick up from where we left off before with verse 5. And what Paul is going to do here in verse 5 through 8, and really this whole passage today, is compare these two opposing natures. The Holy Spirit controlled life versus the fleshly life. Look at verses 8, 5 through 8. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Paul is comparing these two kinds of life in this passage. One that's dominated by the old sinful nature versus one that is being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And those who are living according to the flesh or the old sinful nature in their lives, they're never going to be able to please God. They're constantly pursuing the things of the flesh, the sinful world, the sinful nature. These are the things of the world, and John warns us not to love the world. Look at what John said in in chapter 1 John. This is 1 John 2. I'm sorry, I didn't put the right reference there, but this is it. So you might put a one in front of that in your bulletin. He said, do not love the world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. You see, he warns us about not allowing the, whole, the old sinful nature to control us as believers in Christ. And again, we cannot please the Father. We cannot please God if we're allowing the whole old nature to consume us. But we who are believers are controlled by the Spirit and have the mind of Christ. 
Our desires are to please Christ. We are Holy Spirit controlled, Christ controlled, and God focused. You see, these two lives are going into two opposite directions. The life that's dominated by the desires of the activities of the flesh, the old sinful nature, is on its way to death. Their future is destruction in a fallen world that will also eventually be destroyed. But those who are spirit controlled are concerned with building an eternal kingdom and they have God's love in their heart and they experience joy and peace. They have peace with God. The inner assurance that their sins are forgiven and that whatever is going on in their lives, they have a secure future in God. And we're going to look at that further and later on in, in Romans chapter 8 where we look at some passages of Scripture dealing with suffering. But we know God's in control and the Holy Spirit is still leading that life. But Paul states that those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. And we can only please God if we're living a Holy Spirit-controlled life. And again, that looks at the whole Old Testament. When you're trying to keep the law, when you're trying to do what's right in your own power, you will never be able to do it. But when we do this in our lives, when we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, then we will live lives that are seeking to please God. Look at what Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians. He said, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. How much time do you ponder and contemplate how you can please the Lord? See, that's when the Holy Spirit's in charge. And we'll be able to determine what pleases the Lord when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide our lives. And when we do this, our lives will be fruitful. And John promises also that our prayers will be answered as well. Look at what 1 John 3.22 says. And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. And this is his commandment, that we must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. See, there's a promise here. And often it is unfortunately taken out of context. He says we will receive anything we ask. But what's the condition of that promise? The condition is that we obey him and we do the things that please him. So if I'm not living a life pleasing to him and seeking to obey God, can I expect him to answer all my prayers? No. But so many people are out there doing that. But when we're Christ-centered and Christ-controlled, we will obey Him. Now what is that obedience about? And there's a key component. And I really haven't talked about this a lot with the law. It's not about keeping a Sabbath day. It's not about keeping the old Ten Commandments. It's not about following all the feast days. It's not about all of the letter of the law that you see throughout the Old Testament. There are those who would say that's what it's talking about. But he says here very clearly what it is. And what is that? First of all, to have faith in Christ. Jesus said this in John 6 when they came to him and said, what must we do to have eternal life? You remember his answer? Believe on him whom God has sent. Believe on me. That's what's pleasing to God. See, as long as I'm striving in my flesh and trying to do what's pleasing to God and seeking to be pleasing to God, we're nullifying the blood of Jesus. Do you understand that? It's like we're saying, God, that's not enough. That's why we do not acknowledge Jehovah Witnesses as a Christian religion. Why is that? Because they are working for their salvation. Jesus wasn't enough. They're still trying to be pleasing to God. 
But it's when we have trusted in Him and we are fully convinced that we are saved by grace alone through faith in Him and nothing else we can do, that pleases God. But the other thing, and he says it in this passage, is that we love one another. All of the law and the commandments are in loving God and loving others. And so the idea is I am not thinking about my own desires and how I can fulfill me and live a life that's pleasing to me and get all my dreams and wants done. I am seeking to please God by loving others. What can I do to help those around me? How can I love my neighbor? And that is pleasing to God. That we love Him, we're trusting Him, and we're seeking to love others. So the question is, is my greatest desire to please the Lord? Do I really want to please Him? You see, if I seek to fill my life with the things of the world, I should question my salvation. If I am whole bent on what I want and not what God wants, I should question my salvation. I should doubt my salvation. And Paul addresses this in Romans 8 9 after he affirms the truth for believers. Look at 8 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Who's he speaking to? The Roman Christians. You're not controlled by that old nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Great big word there. What is it? If. And then it's in parentheses here, and I think it should be, but it is in Scripture. This is not an addition somebody added. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. Again, this affirms what I've already said. If you're a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit is living in you. And if the Holy Spirit is living in you, guess what? You are not going to be controlled by your old sinful nature. You will want to please God. You will want to do that. And so Paul is reminding the Christians there in Rome of the difference between themselves and those he's been describing in the previous verses that are controlled by their old sinful nature. If you're truly a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you and you will live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Paul, Paul is clearly stating that if the Holy Spirit's not indwelling a person, they are not saved. And this is what we looked at several years ago in James, in James chapter 4, verse 4, he said, You adulterous people. How many of you remember that passage? Strong passage. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, whoever, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And if you're an enemy of God, guess what? You are not a believer in Christ. And so love with the world is making yourself an enemy of Christ, which is a lost person. Now I want to state this, and I think it's important. That does not mean we can't hinder or grieve the Holy Spirit. We can diminish the Holy Spirit's work in our life. And Paul warns about this in two other places. In 1 Thessalonians, he says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to stifle somebody? You're hindering them from doing what they want to do. And we have that ability because God is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. He will not force himself on us. And we can stifle him from doing the work he wants to do in our lives. In Ephesians 4.30, he says this, and do not bring sorrow on God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing you will be saved on the day of redemption. So we can stifle the Holy Spirit. We can bring sorrow and grieve God. But here's the key. The general direction of our lives will be to please and obey God. This means you will love the things of Christ, and that you will do the things that Christ wants us to do. You will love God and your neighbor. 
and you will see God's will in what you do, not your own will. And, and I think this is a key component, if you are struggling with sin in your life, you will be like Paul in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. You will be crying out for help. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And if you're indifferent to that struggle of sin, then probably the Holy Spirit is not there. Because if you are struggling in sin, you will remain in the fight that Paul remained in and you will find victory over that sin. If you're just succumbing to it and saying, well, I just can't do anything about it, just me. I'm just the way I am. Then we need to, we need to question where we belong and who we are and where the Holy Spirit really is indwelling us. And I think that's what Paul is really challenging with us in this passage. But he finishes this little section. And again, when I say finishes, the whole chapter should be preached at one time, but you guys aren't going to be here until 3 o'clock. Um, I'll be alone. So I'll, I'm going to close with these last two verses. But they're very important verses about our hope and why we continue to strive, why we continue to fight against our old sinful nature, why we live to please God. Look at verses 10 and 11. And Christ lives within you. Again, he follows up those that don't have the Holy Spirit, don't belong to God at all. But he's reaffirming the church. And he says, and Christ lives in you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you Give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. And again, it's like Paul is going back to verse 25 of chapter 7 and saying, who will deliver me from this wretched body that I'm living in? Because, again, as long as we have life and breath, we will struggle in a body that is dying. A body that is Struggling with sin. And that is the reality we live in. And our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in eternity. And so this temporal body that we are walking around in, that is slowly deteriorating and getting worse and worse and worse, that will eventually die. Guess what? That's not our end. Our end is in eternity with heaven. Paul shares this at length, and it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And I often read this at funerals because I think it's so important. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die, and leave this earthly body. We will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. By the way, I spent a good portion of yesterday laying rock, and I couldn't hardly move last night. And, you know, I was groaning and moaning, and you know, and I laid rock, the rest of the rock, about 20 years ago, and I don't remember it being that hard. But we groan and sigh. And it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. And again, I don't know anybody that says, man, you know, I just done, I want to get out of here. There are a few. It's not that. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. 
these new bodies will be swallowed up by life. And the last verse in that says, God himself has prepared us for this. And he's given us a guarantee in the Holy Spirit. See, what we now have in dwelling us, in part, will be fulfilled. Not only will we be given bodies that groan, don't groan inside, it will be bodies that will never sin. And that's our hope. And that hope should encourage us and motivate every day of our lives. We will delight in God's will and gladly heed it for we're daily becoming more like Him. And that is a key to this passage. Paul says, I strive to become what God wants me to be. He never was satisfied. And that's the one area that we should never show contentment. You see, the Spirit-controlled life, the, li the Christ-centered life, the God-focused life is daily coming near to heaven, even while we're here on earth. It is a life with continual progress toward God that the final transition of death is only a natural, inevitable thing. I'm going to bring up an Old Testament figure we know very little about. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you everything we know about him. But I think his life exemplifies what we should be doing in our lives. And it's a passage of scripture about Enoch. Look what the scripture said about Enoch. Enoch lived 365 years. By the way, that doesn't apply to you and me. Walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. That is all we know about Enoch. But here's what I surmise from this, and I think most scholars do. That Enoch walked so close to the Lord that he just went home. Now that's not going to be the case for you and me. That is one of only two people that never experienced death that we know of, Enoch and Elijah. But here's the point. As we grow older and older and older and we are coming closer and closer and closer to that time when we will leave this earth, our lives should reflect Christ and we become more godly that that transition is just kind of a, a little bump in the road. We should not arrive in heaven and go, wow, what a big difference this was. There will be those that do. But every moment of every day, whether you're seven years old here today or <clears throat> some 80-something years old, we should be transitioning and we should be able to look at our lives day by day, month by month, year by year, decade by decade, and see the progress towards overcoming sin, to becoming more godly, to becoming more pleasing to Christ. It shouldn't be that we look back at our life and we say, look at all the stuff I amassed. Look at how I achieved my goals. You know, I was talking to my CPE instructor the other day, and he's 10 years older than I am, actually over that. And he's been such a great mentor for me. But here's one of the things he said. Everything we purchase has a time-related stamp to it. Think about your life and all the toys you have and all the things you've amassed. Every one of those things has a time-related stamp on it. If you buy a new car, let's say you buy a new, now it's forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. How long do you have to work to get that car? You buy a new cell phone. How long do you have to work to get that phone? Because it didn't just happen. 
Young people, what is your goal in life? I counseled with a young man a while back. And he said, I'm afraid. I said, afraid of what? He said, I'm afraid of not reaching my goal in life. And I said, what's your goal in life? He said, I want to be a millionaire. I said, first of all, that's the wrong goal. And you need to be afraid. And I told him that. Because that is not a Christ-centered goal. That's not a goal from the Lord. You need to seek what God's will is for your life and what he wants to do in your life and let him handle how much money you make. You see, we have made, and I believe that this is one of the biggest issues we deal with in our world today, and I think it's one of the biggest issues in the church today. We have made money an idol. And Jesus warned us, you cannot serve God and money at the same time. Too much of our goals and our plans in life are surrounded with the almighty dollar. And as somebody said, there are no U-Haul trailers behind the hearse. We can't take it with us. So is my goal in life to amass stuff that I will leave behind? Or is it to become like Jesus Christ? The one who saved me, the one who loves me, the one who's given me a hope and eternity far beyond anything this world can ever give me? Or is it in what I can achieve for me? It's the challenge that Paul is leaving with us. It's interesting, Paul is going to transition by the end of next week, and I'm not sure exactly where I'll finish next week's sermon, but he is going to start dealing with suffering. Because here's the other part. You can amass massive wealth and massive stuff in this world and you're still going to suffer. That is no hedge against the suffering. I saw something yesterday that says people are not spending money right now because of all the things going on in the world and the recession coming. And they're blaming the recession, saying it's coming. And there are people that are worried and hoarding and doing all this stuff. Is God going to take care of us or not? A week ago, we were praying for rain. Today, we're seeing the rain. Is God going to take care of us? He will. And it doesn't matter how high gas prices go. You know, I filled up my pickup the other day, and it was a lot of money. And I made the comment to Sherry when we were driving away from the pump, I wonder if we'll see in our lifetime $10 a gallon gas. And you know what? I don't care. We need to have that attitude. Because God is in control. And if we're trusting Him, it doesn't matter if it's $20 a gallon. See, God is in control. And my focus needs to be on Him. And building His kingdom and fulfilling His purpose for my life. And that's what Paul is challenging us. And that's victory. See, I, need, I don't need to focus on that little sin thing that just keeps hounding at me. I need to focus on him and building his kingdom. And somehow that thing may just go away. Didn't go away for Paul, by the way. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. We still don't know what it was. I want to surmise that it probably was some sin he couldn't get over. A lot of people say it was blindness. A lot of people say it was crippling. It may have been malaria. It could have been a physical issue. Whatever it was, Paul didn't focus on it, did he? He focused on what the Lord wanted him to do. So I'm going to ask if you come forward, and those of you that are visiting with us this morning, and we have visitors, we celebrate the Lord's table in this church every Sunday. 
And it's the Lord's table and you're invited and we welcome you to come and partake of it with us. And so we gather, we get the elements and we go back to our seats and we take it together. So if you can come down this aisle and go, that our soul desire, our heart's desire, our goal in life is to please you. And with the hope that someday, when that day comes and we go home to be with you, that'll be just a bump in the road because we've already achieved and overcome the things in our life because we have allowed your spirit to have control. Accomplish that in every one of our lives, Lord. Regardless of where we are today, guide us on that path that we may trust you and allow you to empower us to become your children that we may make an impact in the world today and that we will live forever with you in eternity. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, happy Father's Day to all of you. If you haven't uh, gotten your headlamp uh, on your way out, there's a box there for you men. And have a wonderful Father's Day. I'm going to go to Cortez and have lunch with my sons and my granddaughter. And so we're going to enjoy Father's Day. I hope you do as well. Let's close with our benediction from Romans 8:39. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you. Have a great week and enjoy the rain. I hope you.